My name is Carolyn Evans. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Graduate and International at the University of Melbourne. And it's my pleasure on behalf of the University to welcome you and to welcome some particularly special people tonight. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which the event is taking place, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. As we come to celebrate political leadership, I would like to pay my respects to the leaders and the elders of the Wurundjeri people, past, present and emerging, uh, and the leaders from the Indigenous community here within our own university. Could I remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that tonight is a public oration and the proceedings are being recorded and will be made available through a number of the university's media challenges, channels. <laughs> the university is so pleased to be part of this exciting new initiative in collaboration with the Susan McKinnon Foundation. The foundation was established in 2015 by Dr Sophie O and Mr Grant Rule to fulfil their desire to make a positive difference to society. The foundation believes that better leadership is the key to a brighter future for Australia. By fostering better leadership, the foundation aims to create more effective government and obtain the greatest leverage for positive change to our society and to our economy. This is the sort of thing that so many of us talk about over our dinner tables, complain about with our friends, but these people have actually taken a positive step to make this change. And what a great pleasure it is to welcome both Grant and Sophie to this evening's oration. Uh, perhaps we could just take a moment. To... I would also like to welcome Sam Mellett, director of the Susan McKinnon Foundation and uh, the person herself, uh, Sue McKinnon. She is here tonight and it's a great pleasure to have all of you with us. Could I particularly welcome, in a, in a very distinguished audience, members of the McKinnon Prize Selection Panel who've been able to attend this evening, Mr Andrew McKenzie, CEO of BHP Bulletin, Dr Helen Zoki, CEO of Oxfam, Mr Key Wong, founder of Eccentric Innovations, and Ms Fleur Studd, founder of Market Lane Coffee. Uh, could I also acknowledge the tremendous work done by many members of the selection panel, and it was a very distinguished selection panel that took this task extremely seriously. We'd also like to welcome members of the Melbourne School of Government Advisory Board, the Chair, the Honourable John Brumby, the Honourable Judith Troth, Mr Miles Cooper, Ms Anna Cronin, and the Director of the Melbourne School of Government, Professor John Howe. And finally, of course, we welcome the people that we're all here to hear from tonight, the McKinnon Prize winners themselves, Senator Dean Smith and Councillor Vonda Malone, of them more later. The purpose of this evening is to celebrate the winners of the inaugural McKinnon Prize in Political Leadership. Now, as many of you already know, this is prize is a new, independent and strictly non-partisan award for outstanding political leadership in Australia. At the launch of the prize last year in Canberra, our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Glyn Davies, who is overseas today or otherwise would have very much liked to have been here, remarked that the prize aims to celebrate political leaders at all levels of government, and we're seeing that tonight, recognising those who have driven positive change and sparking a national conversation about the role of politicians and our aspiration for leadership in Australia. It fits very closely with the university's mission and through the School of Government, we're very pleased to be collaborating with the Susan McKinnon Foundation to develop this prize. The Melbourne School of Government aims to address the challenges facing contemporary government and to develop shared, sustainable solutions to those challenges uh, through a range of research, teaching and engagement. Well, this National Prize, a wonderful piece of engagement, celebrates outstanding political leaders at federal, state or local government levels and aims to inspire current and perhaps future political leaders across the country. On the 26th of February, an esteemed selection panel, including two former Prime Ministers, Julia Gillard and John Howard, as, many, as well as many other distinguished leaders from the business, government and education, sporting arenas, selected the inaugural winners. And it's a great pleasure indeed to be part of the celebration of their success tonight. I'd now like to introduce you to this evening's MC, Mr Jim Middleton from Sky News, to introduce the winners of the prize in political leadership and invite them to share something of their leadership journey with us. Uh, there is a note of sadness tonight because before we, we go on to that celebration, Jim's going to say a few words in recognition of journalist Michael Gordon, who, as I'm sure you all know, passed away on the 3rd of February this year. Following a long and distinguished career with The Age, Michael's final work included two highly regarded interviews on political leadership with John Howard and Julia Gillard in support of this prize. Please welcome Jim Middleton.
Thank you very much, Professor Evans. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is a pleasure to be here tonight to take part in the inaugural McKinnon Prize in Political Leadership Award uh, and Oration. Uh, to say that an award of this nature is overdue, given the parlous state of Australian politics in general and leadership specifically, is uh, an understatement to say the least. Uh, Grant Rule and Sophie O are to be congratulated for coming up with the idea at the University of Melbourne for executing it and making it a reality. Congratulations too to the university for selecting Michael Gordon to do the work which has given the inaugural awards much more prominence than they would otherwise have achieved. Mickey was not only the finest journalist I've ever known, he was also my dearest friend. Less than six weeks ago, he died as he was competing in an ocean swim on Phillip Island. He was, as I have said in other places, a child of the sea. He was a journalist for 44 years. He joined the age as a cadet at the age of 17 and spent 37 years with that paper. He was sports editor, among many other roles, surfing correspondent for a time, police roundsman, as they were called in those days, industrial relations reporter, political reporter, rising to the position of national political editor, a position he also held at The Australian from 1994 to 1998. And last year, he won the Walkley Award for most outstanding contribution to journalism one of the most prestigious awards in Australian journalism. Michael was considered by many in the media to be both a mentor and a mate. And the outpouring of tributes following his death in February, not only from media colleagues, but from those working on all sides of politics, is testament to the extraordinary esteem in which he was held. Michael survived by his wife, Robin, his co-pilot, as he so often called her, their children, Scott and Sarah, and also his young grandson, Harry. I'd like to thank Robin for being with us tonight. Robin, you're a champion. <laughs> On behalf of all those involved with the McKinnon Prize, I'd also like to acknowledge Michael's outstanding contribution to political journalism over many years, and in particular for his final thought-provoking interviews with John Howard and Julia Gillard. Written in support of the McKinnon Prize, these, these pieces meticulously explored the nature of contemporary political leadership in Australia. As I joked with him in one of our last conversations, mate, you're in the paper nearly as often as when you work for them. His response was uh, a very modest chuckle. Still breaking news he was up to the day before, or almost the day before he died, winning an acknowledgement, for example, from Mr Howard in one of the pieces that he wrote to support this prize, uh, an acknowledgement that his gun reforms had helped boost One Nation. It's a point that was denied to Mickey by the Prime Minister when he was writing for The Australian in the 1990s. And uh, once again, there was a quiet chuckle from Mickey as he revealed that fact to me a day or two before it was printed. Michael's rich body of work will endure. His final writings on the McKinnon Prize have formed the foundation on which the important national conversation on the future of Australian and Australia's political leadership will now be based. It's a substantial and great tribute to him and great testimony to, her, to him and a fine epitaph to what, as I say, is the finalist journalist I have known. It's now my pleasure to introduce the winners of the McKinnon Prize in political leadership and invite them to speak to you tonight. First of all, Councillor Vonda Malone who's been named the McKinnon Emerging Political Leader of the Year 
a prize awarded for an elected politician who served less than five years in office. <laughs> Following a career of more than 20 years in government and community organisations, Vonda was elected the first female, uh, the first female mayor of Torres Shire Council in 2016. She's been recognised by the McKinnon Prize Selection Panel for her outstanding efforts in bringing together her community, addressing key issues, issues like unemployment, housing shortages, waste management, community engagement, health and wellbeing. Her collaborative and values-based approach has been widely recognised. Vonda is no stranger to firsts. She was the first Torres Strait Islander woman to work as an Australian diplomat and the first Torres Strait Islander woman to go to the United Nations and complete uh, the Indigenous Fellowship Program. She's an inspiring leader who does not accept limitations. It's my pleasure now to invite Professor John Howe, Director of the Melbourne School of Government, to prevent Councillor Vonda Malone with the award for McKinnon Emerging Political Leader of the Year and to invite Vonda to address us now. Good evening, everyone. I must say it's a real honour to be here tonight. I want to start by acknowledgements to the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of this land in which we are privileged to gather and meet. I pay my due respects to their elders, past, present and those to follow. Thank you for making me welcomed. It is a great honour to be here and address you this evening as the inaugural recipient of the McKinnon Prize for Emerging Political Leader of the Year. I must say I hadn't heard about this prize until I was nominated, and I'm really grateful that there is such a thing that's recognising Indigenous leadership as well as in leadership in Australia. I stand before you as a proud female Torres Strait Islander woman, an island girl from the remote island, isolated islands of the Torres Strait. I'm humbled in receiving such accolades and recognition at a national level so early in my political career. I'm actually verging on my second year of my term, so next month will be two years. I'd like to express my sincere thanks to the McKinnon Prize for Political Leadership Selection Panel and acknowledge our two former Prime Ministers, the former Julia, Honourable Julie Gillard, and Honourable John Howard, along with their fellow distinguished panel representatives, the University of Melbourne Vice-Chancellor Glyn Davis, the Melbourne School of Government, the Susan McKinnon Foundation. And I must apologise if I've forgotten anybody. Um, there is such a lot of people involved in this. <laughs> so I, I um, commend you and thank you very much. In reaching this milestone, I can't lose sight of those that supported me and believed in me, my family, first and foremost, my husband, my children, my close friends and colleagues, a number of which are here tonight, and I'm really glad that they can join me on this special occasion. I'd also like to commend and congratulate Senator Dean Smith for also receiving the Political Leader of the Year McKinnon Prize and to, for, for meeting him tonight. I mean, it's such a, such a tremendous uh, thing that you have done for Australia. And um, I, I must admit, I didn't think I would be able to meet you and I'm privileged to meet you tonight. Also take this moment to dedicate this prize to my mum, 
Mary Isabella, Bella Moore, and my grandma, Simon Gila, two strong women that encouraged and moulded and gu guided me. They allowed me the freedom to develop into the person I've become without imposing any preconceived boundaries or restrictions. To echo, the, to echo this year's NADOC theme, because of them, I can. I can continue to draw strength from their legacy in representing the people of my region. This national rec recognition has not only brought me out of the shadows, it also allowed all Torres Strait women to shine and bring to the fore the skills they inherently possess for the betterment of their communities. I'd like to share a little bit about, about me. I grew up on Thursday Island, it's a remote island in the Torres Strait, and also from uh, the island of Erub in the eastern cluster of the Torres Strait. I was far removed from mainstream Australian society. I starved for educational opportunity and a system that encouraged mediocrity. I committed early on to finish high school and decided that I was going to do things differently. I adopted a direction of embracing out of the norm opportunities, including working overseas as an Australian diplomat with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and with the United Nations Office of the Human Rights Commission, both of which expediated my experience in the wider world, as well as being a mother at a young age at the arrival of my daughter early in my career. Opportunities for positive growth and professionalism continued within the federal and state government sectors. Being naturally ambitious, I was unwilling to accept the status quo that disadvantaged those around me and in my community. I often encountered resistance, lateral violence, and ongoing suppression stemming from male counterparts from within my community and from the saviors from elsewhere. Only often through my tireless work I've, as being a change maker over the years was hardly recognized or acknowledged. This provided even greater motivation to aim higher and drive improved standards in health and well-being for my people based on good governance and leadership. Breaking that cycle in the glass ceilings at various stages of my career not only empowered me, but provided an encouragement and an example to island women who were too afraid to step forward for fear of losing their positions, employment, alienating their family and pushing the boundaries from island custa, custom and passing. I was their voice. This was not without personal sacrifice and at times was a lonely path, especially in communities where equity for women was not seen as a priority. These trials gave me the foundation and strength to achieve the greater role of becoming the first female mayor of the Torres Strait Council. Torres Strait Islanders have a long, for a long time, tried to elevate our existence and our issues to successive Australian governments, state and federal, and the wider Australian public. But this has often been dampened by the noise of mainland Indigenous affairs at large. Most Australians do not realise that Cape York is the only most northerly part of the mainland, and there is, exist vibrant, distinctive Indigenous communities inhabiting the area from Cape York to the Papua New Guinea border. Politicians and policymakers are more comfortable asserting sweeping national positions rather than in engaging with different and distinctives. It is time that we're taken seriously gaining recognition of our unique culture as First Nations people, our aspirations, our challenges, and our considerable contribution to protecting Australia. Torres Strait is the only part of Australia that backs onto an international border with Papua New Guinea. Torres Shire, which is the shire in which I am responsible for, encompasses Thursday Island, Waibeni, a group of islands that lie immediately off Cape York in far north Australia, and it's the doorstep to the Torres Strait region, an area with over 100 islands. Torres Shire was established in 1903 and is a small mainstream council. 
It is a multicultural community with a population in excess of 3,500. 75% of whom are Torres Strait and Aboriginal people. Being classified as a mainstream council provides a complexity as it sits within an Indigenous island region. As a council, we do not receive much needed additional assistance from the government compared to our neighbouring sister Indigenous councils. Our Indigenous people are not counted and not in receipt of programs that target remote Indigenous communities when addressing closing the gap targets. Thursday Island is an administration hub of the whole Torres Strait region, accommodating up to 37 state and federal government bodies that fly and deliver fly-in, fly-out services to the region. The ever-growing complexity of government presence here presents our residents with a number of social impediments, including lack of affordable housing, and an overcrowding crisis as a result of housing stock predominantly taken by government departments with minimal funding restraints. Water security, waste management issues due to the influx of government growth. Economic development, local small indigenous business expansion and innovation often stifled by government red tape. The double bind of governments being exempt from general rates while continuing to expect essential services, an enormous burden on the sustainability of councils with a small rate space, such as Torres Shire. High cost of living, impacted by the monopoly of one freight company with no freight subsidy offered by government, although there has been numerous deputations to all governments for up to 20 years. This limits consumer choice with everyday essentials being costly and the subsequent de detrimental link to health and wellbeing outcomes. No structured plan to build community capability and succession planning to reduce the fly in fly out arrangements and enable employment and appropriate localised service delivery. All these matters and more were echoed by Indigenous councils and put forward within the submission to the Queensland Productivity Commission inquiry into services into Indigenous communities last year in November. I encourage governments to take more localised, genuine approaches to addressing needs of communities so that we can fast track and fulfil a total spectrum of close the gap targets. Work with us rather than to us from a distance. We know our communities and we have practical solutions that can deliver greater outcomes and benefits. History has shown that current models of services are inefficient and rife with duplication. Services must enhance and complement what's on the ground and not suffocate and widen the gap. It is encouraging to hear these sentiments being echoed by Martin Parkinson, Secretary of Prime Minister and Cabinet, and I certainly hope that that's the approach that we will take forward, particularly now we're looking at refreshing the close the gap and seeing how we can meet some targets. Torres Strait is naturally a down with beautiful, pristine environment. Recent severe weather events experienced in the region once again highlighted how vulnerable and susceptible our island communities are to the ever-present issue of climate change. It's a local problem, yet a global issue, issue that we share with our neighbouring Pacific island countries. We have to have the tough conversations with our communities and put in place measures to build resilience in our communities within our limited resources. However, this is not enough and we need the help of the Australian government, both state and federal, and the greater Australian public to support us and elevate this issue internationally. Climate change coupled with the very active international border places greater sovereign risk to Australia from our neighbouring countries of Papua New Guinea and Irian Jaya, Indonesia. Torres Strait leaders are deeply engaged and active with monitoring and managing our international border, adding another layer of complexity to local leadership in, is recognising and understanding the dynamics of international movements under the Torres Strait Treaty, including international re relations and community safety, risk to national security, ongoing cross-border public health issues, ongoing risk to Australia's agriculture industry, through potential pests and weeds infestation. It is a live border 
There is no big stretches of water to buffer movement, but merely a four kilometer dinghy ride to our closest, closest community of Saibai Island. Receiving the McKinnon Prize for Emerging Political <coughs> Leader of the Year provides me with a great platform to continue to showcase the contributions Indigenous women can make to the society and to their communities. Uphold a special and unique culture that Torres Strait Islanders are, are proud of. Advocate and highlight that Torres Strait Islanders are in need to improve standards of levels of living and comparable to the rest of Australia. As a minority group, we need stronger voices at the national and international level to embed our existence and to expose the important contribution we make to Australia. I'd like to thank you for sharing this special moment with me. I hope that the recognition that you have given me tonight will encourage both women and Indigenous representatives from remote communities to take the next step in coming forward to proudly represent their communities in the political arena. Thank you for giving me this due respect attention tonight. Have a good evening. Thank you, Vonda, and I got an inkling from uh, what you were saying there as to why it was that the panel did indeed choose you as the uh, emerging leader. Uh, you do stand as a demonstration that the mediocrity, as you put it, of the system surrounding you uh, of not, are not of themselves a reason for striving for success and achievement. Congratulations. <clears throat> Senator Dean Smith has been named the McKinnon Political Leader of the Year, a prize awarded to an elected politician who served more than five years in office. Senator Smith was appointed Senator for Western Australia in May 2012, following a corporate career spanning more than a decade. He's held numerous parliamentary posts, including Chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Human Rights, and Chair of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, in which, in which role, I've got to say, he's enhanced the standing uh, of that committee quite considerably. It now really is a serious matter to come up before the uh, Public Accounts Committee in ways that it was not under the stewardship of some others in the past. He is currently the Deputy Government Whip in the Senate Dean is the Liberal Party's first openly gay federal politician and in February 2015 became a public advocate for equality before the law for same-sex couples in Australia. As you are all no doubt aware, the federal parliament legislated for marriage equality in December last year. As the author of that cross-party bill, Dean's being recognised by the McKinnon Prize Selection Panel for his courageous and bipartisan leadership on the marriage equality issue, one that was both publicly divisive and the subject of much internal opposition as well. It is my pleasure to invite uh, Mr Grant Rule, co-founder of the Susan McKinnon Foundation, to present Senator Dean Smith with the award for the McKinnon Political Leader of the Year and to invite Dean Smith to address us now. Well, let me too begin by paying my respects to the traditional elders of the land on which we meet and to the elders past and present. Professor Evans, Professor Howe, 
representatives of the Susan McKinnon Foundation, the selection panel of the McKinnon Prize, former Premier Brumby, and members of the Melbourne School of Government Advisory Board and students and friends of this fine School of Government. And if you will indulge me just a little, a warm welcome to my mum and my sister from Western Australia. <laughs> I feel like the good and the great of Melbourne are in this room tonight, but what is truly remarkable about this first McKinnon Prize is you've looked beyond this fine city and this good state and presented the first award to a senator from Western Australia and a councillor from the Tory Strait. <laughs> councillor Vonda Malone is the mayor of a small remote community. To be a mayor of such a small community is to be an on-call social worker, parish priest, mediator, and elected official all rolled into one. And regional mayors do it for love and not for reward. Councillor Malone at the last election received 687 votes. That's not many, you might think. I received just 585 <laughs> at my last election. Well-functioning local government in small towns is vital if those communities are to, prosper, prosper, health, uh, to be prosperous, healthy and safe. I'm sure we have much to learn from Councillor Malone, not just from tonight but into the future, and it's my privilege to share this occasion with you and your aspirations for the Torres Strait Islander people. My journey from no to yes started in the most unlikely place. It was on a small plane travelling from Perth to one of our regional communities known as Albany in early 2015. I found myself reflecting on the terrible events at the Lint Cafe and I kept thinking of one man, Tory Johnson. He was the cafe manager and on that day he was as brave as any of our country's finest. He was strong, courageous, and he had a partner, Thomas. As I said in the Senate, I thought of their love, I thought of their loss, and it changed me. Over the past 15 years, millions of other Australians have had their own change of heart. They thought about neighbours, friends, workmates, uncles and aunties, cousins, brothers, sisters, sons and daughters, and for some, children and grandchildren not yet born. The Australian Marriage Postal Survey might have asked a yes or no question, but the truth was that there were a million people on that ballot. It's what made the Postal Survey so painful and in the end so exhilarating. It is to the million LGBTIQ Australians who have walked this walk in the past, in the present and in the future that I dedicate this award tonight. Our journey has been one from rejection to tolerance, from tolerance to acceptance, and in 2017 it moved from acceptance to embrace. We should marvel in it and remember that this good fortune is not shared by many LGBTIQ citizens in so many other parts of the globe. We have every reason to be grateful and thankful for this great Commonwealth of ours. I am, as you all know, a conservative not just in politics, but in principle and outlook as well. It's probably why, after walking my first Mardi Gras parade a few weeks ago with the Australian Marriage Equality Campaigners, I went back to my hotel room and celebrated with a cup of black coffee. <laughs> there was just too much excitement for me in that long march <laughs> on that one night. For conservatives, there is a theme that runs through our lives. It's a chord. As it were, it speaks of tradition, change, and personal responsibility. Conservatives understand there is wisdom in tradition and institutions. They help us understand the world and find meaning. They provide a stable foundation to help navigate through shifting times. Conservatives are not opposed to change. We simply require it to be weighed and tested. We move cautiously and with humility because we know that we do not have all the answers. We understand Edmund Burke's dictum that society is a pact, a very precious pact between the dead, the living and the yet unborn. 
This chord reflects a fidelity of the past as well as a call to make the world a better place for the next generation. In marriage equality, there was a tension between those two loyalties, to the traditions of the past, but also to the hopes of the future. While I was not an early adopter of marriage equality, I wrestled with these tensions for some time. I did come to the yes cause late, but fortunately not too late. Like St Paul, I came to the conclusion that there are three things in life that endure, faith, hope and love and the greatest of these is love. The issue of marriage equality took its time to resolve. On reflection, it took too long, 15 years. But sometimes change in life is, an, is instant. The right confluence of events, people and courage brings rapid change quickly. John Howard and guns was one of those moments in our country's history. Our country will always be in the debt of John Howard, but as well as Tim Fisher, Kim Beasley, Cheryl Kerno, and the Coalition and Labor State Premiers for the leadership they showed. Other times, change is slow, because sometimes we all need space to engage, to think, to clarify, and to build a coalition and help an issue ripen. Marriage equality was one of those changes. For the most part, this debate was not led by politicians, though we brought the debate to a successful conclusion. It was a debate that was won in living rooms, at kitchen tables, around barbecues, from the Torres Strait to our base in the Antarctic, though perhaps not with too many barbecues. It was change brought by a movement of people, not just by one or two leaders. It was but one part of a self-generating movement of Australians. They are the people that own any honour. This movement had a spirit that was an antidote to the cynicism that has plagued our times. During the postal survey, there were young Liberals from the Liberals and Nats for Yes campaign who designed leaflets, photocopied them and handed them out. And I thank those of them that are with me tonight. There were others who wrote letters to their neighbours telling their stories and inviting them to pop around if they wanted to know more, if they wanted to share some. Thousands more shared something of their hopes and their fears on Facebook, in opinion pages, letters to editors and by contacting their elected representatives. There were phone bankers, door knockers and those who financially supported the campaign. In this campaign there were Liberal volunteers working side by side with Labor and Green supporters demonstrating that foot, foot soldiers of our parties are first and foremost the foot soldiers of our liberal democracy. In accepting this noble award from the Melbourne School of Government and the Susan McKinnon Foundation, I honour every person who participated in this long campaign. And of course, I honour my parliamentary colleagues. Uh, long before I moved from no to yes, there were people like Warren Inch championing change. In fact, he was championing it when Mr Howard was Prime Minister. Others like Senator Wong, Senator Rice and Senator Pratt were also pointing the way and shared their lived experiences. Colleagues who I consider brethren, Trent Zimmerman, Trevor Evans and the recently married Tim Wilson demonstrated that you can take an oath for your country to serve then you can make a solemn vow to another to do the same. And I extend a very personal bouquet to your own Senator, Jane Hume, for her great courage and conviction and personal support. For the record, 133 out of 150 electorates in Australia agreed, including 71 out of 76 coalition electorates. In my third reading speech, I reflected on a debate that inspired Australians, we saw life experiences inform decisions, passionate and respectful debate, carefully considered amendments, reason and intellect. We saw senators and members debating and listening to each other. For my part, the process included participating in the Senate committee, taking the government's exposure draft and negotiating with parties from the Greens to the Liberal Democrats. It meant understanding the process, finding common ground, negotiating and building trust. And for a long time, we showed great restraint and trust in each other and didn't broadcast our activities to the media. 
What became known as the Smith Bill was already in the public arena for almost five months before we started the Senate debate in November last year. The debate itself reflected everything that it should have, passion, conscience and conviction. And I'm not just referring to yes senators. By the end of the debate, every Australian could point to a representative who faithfully presented their view. In the end, the Australian Parliament worked as it was designed to. Even as the dust has settled, I've never seen the result as a win. It's a change. No one has lost. Rather, our country offered acceptance and embrace to a million of its citizens and thereby strengthened the bonds between all of us. The parliamentary debate prompted me to ask a question in my third reading speech, why isn't our parliament like this more often? I believe it can be. Not by changing, but by rediscovering what it's always been, a state's house and a people's house. Australians are frustrated by the hyper-partisanship we see in our daily national life. This award is a reflection of the yearn of Australians for their elected representatives to focus on solutions, to find common ground, to give and take, because we all share this single continent, this wonderful country. I believe executive government must renew its trust in its parliament. In the Senate, we have that platform to develop national approaches to issues that are too easily put in the too hard basket, and we should use the Senate as it was intended to do. To this end, I intend to devote myself to finding common ground on the issue of federal state financial reform, and in particular, the GST issue that <laughs> plagues us in the West. In 2019, the GST agreement will be 20 years old. While there cannot be much interest in some parts of Australia in this issue, I can say clearly that it is corroding our great federation. From the days of the 10th Light Horse, Western Australia has always prided itself on our difference with our brothers and sisters in the East. We do it no differently than siblings joke about their own differences. But I have to be clear, the issue of GST is corrosive on our federation. In life, corrosion is silent and it weakens. In a world that is dividing and splintering, we need to tend to what keeps us strong. The idea of a commonwealth where all states are treated equally is being lost because of an agreement that is no longer working as it was intended. Even John Howard has acknowledged that the change in Western Australia's finances was not envisaged in 1999. By addressing the GST in the context of broader federal state financial relations, we can lift it above the win-lose lens that often characterises changes in our national tax arrangements. Of course, we need the states to be involved, but maybe a Commonwealth position that reflects the shared position of government, opposition and most crossbenchers will lift this debate out of partisan quagmire and allow an issue to be found free of party blame. To this end, I'm proposing a Senate committee to commence its work in the second half of 2019. It will need both parties to commit to such a committee before the next election. The committee should not produce a majority and minority report, but one report reflecting the shared position of the Commonwealth Parliament. And frankly, the only time to do that is in the first year of a new parliamentary term. Some might say that sounds too difficult. Yes, it is. But getting the Liberal, Labor, <coughs> Greens, Liberal Democrats, Xenophon team and Darren Hinch to agree a bill, a draft bill as it was once then, was difficult as well. But we did it. No one got everything they wanted, but that's what happens when you develop a common approach. So what of leadership? Leadership is that living thing, that melting pot. Courage of your convictions, authenticity of character, a preparedness for betrayal when hoping for a well of trust, forbearance in those moments of aloneness, graciousness in the crowd of victors, and always faith. 
there are powerful lessons to be learned from the year that has just gone, and we must reflect upon them and think carefully about them. May I conclude by congratulating the Melbourne School and, Gov Melbourne School and Government and the Susan McKinnon Foundation for this initiative. I'm a big believer in schools of government. I believe we need to see more of them, not because I believe government is the answer to every human problem, but because schools of government cultivate the ethos of service so often lost in our modern life. I'm a person of faith and I see politics as a vocation. It is about service and the belief that we can all make our land a better place. That belief in vocation is not just a Christian belief. It reflects the yearn of so many to leave footprints that point to a path that is better for all of us. And in saying that, may I honour two people. Grant Rule, you have lent your mother's name to a foundation and in turn to this award. Your actions speak to her character. I pay tribute to the foundation <coughs> along with your co-founder, Dr Sophie O. And in following up Jim Middleton's fine words, I add my own about Michael Gordon. Michael was passionate for the causes he believed in because he was fair as well. He saw journalism in the same way as so many of us see politics, and that is as a path and a means to a better, fairer world. Robin Carter, thank you for joining us, and thank you for sharing Michael with Australia. May I conclude with words that I hope are taught at this School of Government. They are words of the German philosopher Max Weber. In an essay entitled Politics as a Vocation, he wrote them 99 years ago. Politics is a strong and slow boring of hard boards. It takes both passion and perspective. Certainly all historical experience confirms the truth that man would not have attained the possible unless time and again he had reached out for the impossible. But to do that, a man must be a leader, and not only a leader, but a hero as well, in a very sober sense of the word. And even those who are neither leaders nor heroes must arm themselves with the steadfastness of heart, which can brave even the crumbling of all hopes. This is necessary right now, or else men will not be able to attain even that which is possible today. Only he has the calling of politics who is sure that he shall not crumble when the world from his point of view is too stupid or too base for what he wants to offer. Only he who in the face of all of this can say, in spite of all, has the calling for politics. May this award foster and encourage that great vocation of politics and public service. And I am so deeply honoured to be one of its first two recipients. Wonderful speech, Dean Smith. Uh, forgive me a brief indulgence, which is that <clears throat> I'm old enough as a reporter to remember sitting late at night in the Senate or the House of Representatives when either chamber was in committee. And uh, you would be surprised today at the number of occasions where ministers sitting at the desk would listen to and accept amendments being offered to bills by backbenchers from both sides. In those days, long ago some people would say, I'd like to say it was not that long ago, <laughs> uh, that was how the parliament operated. And what you managed to achieve with the same sex debate and legislation was in that spirit with the great consequences that we have seen as a result. 
as you say, it was a victory of principle over pragmatism, or as I'm saying, it's a victory over, over, of principle over pragmatism, but one achieved without the rancour that so often visits the political debate today. The cynic within me would say, GST, good luck. <laughs> but if the quiet determination that you showed in sharing with us your personal journey from no to yes, and then uh, working quietly, but with quiet determination to achieve the result that your transformation dictated was, I think, a great demonstration of what the politicians of this nation could do if they allowed themselves to behave more like you have. Congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the formal proceedings for this evening. I'd like to thank the University of Melbourne, the Melbourne School of Government, and the Susan McKinnon Foundation for their work in bringing this initiative together. It is a truly remarkable and, as I said at the beginning, overdue initiative. It's a demonstration to the rest of the political class and culture as to what can be achieved. I'd like to thank all of you also for coming along this evening. Most importantly, thank you to the inaugural McKinnon Prize winners, Vonda Malone and Dean Smith for being here tonight and sharing their stories of leadership with us. And will you join us and join me, I should say, once again in congratulating them on their success. <laughs>